God's Word with you this morning. The reason I'm here this morning is because last night about 8 o'clock, two of the officers of your church showed up at my home and in the next hour or so convinced me that I should take this service this morning. <laughs> Amen. You do a wonderful job. Not only that, but they gave me a specific topic to speak on. <laughs> Chuck, is your mic on mute? A little transmitter? No, it's switched across from you. What? what? Does it need to be on mute? No, no. no. It's across from you. Is this working? Well, it doesn't seem to be coming through now, but that's why I'm asking, is it on mute? No, it's not. It's directly 180 degrees away from you. Okay. It's yeah. What is it on? Well, that's another question. <laughs> I looked for some light here and I didn't see it. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Now you really get to take a look at that. The topic that I was asked to speak on is faith, faith of Jesus. I want to explore the word faith from Scripture as God has inspired the Bible writers to discuss this subject. And so what I'm going to do or attempt to do is to discuss the two phases of faith. The dictionary defines objective as something that is a fact, an event, something that has happened and that you are aware that it's happened, that it's a fact. The other usage of the word that I'm going to explore with you this morning is subjective. So let's begin with objective. It is a, is it a historical biblical fact that someone by the name of Jesus came to this earth approximately 2,000 two years ago? Is it a fact? Yes. yes. Okay. And the other word that we're going to explore is subjective. Subjective is something that has to do with something that you have seen, something that you have heard, and has had an impact on you. It has affected you to the point that it has made a change in your life. James says to us in James chapter 2, 19, and I'll quote it to you, you believe that there is one God. The word believe in the Bible is the same word as faith. They come from the same word. In English, we use faith and belief. But in the original language, it comes from the same word. You believe that there is one God. You do well. The devil and his demons also believe. Is that an objective fact or a subjective fact? Objective faith or subjective faith? The fact that Satan and his demons believe. Is that an objective fact? Yes. Of course it is. Yes. Even the Jewish historian Josephus wrote about Jesus. And he said, yes, a man, an Israelite, lived among us. And we thought he was an imposter, so we crucified him. Is it a fact to them that a man by the name of Jesus lived among them. Yes. yes. But he did not have an impact on them from the standpoint of subjective faith. I would like to invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to see a very good example in Scripture about subjective faith. Subjective faith is something that you have seen or heard and it has had an impact on you. It has had an effect on you. It has possibly changed your life. So, let's see how the Apostle Paul 
describes subjective faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us, having concluded this, that one singular died for all, plural, therefore all died. We're just talking grammar here right now. Verse 15, And he died for all, plural, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. When I looked up some of these words in my Bible dictionary, call it concordance, it had an incredible impact on me because it took me to other scriptures. One of the scriptures that it took me to was Romans chapter 5, verse 12. If you're interested, Romans chapter 5, I'll wait, and when you get there, say ready, and I'll read it to you. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Ready? Paul has been talking about a series of things regarding what happens when we accept Jesus as our Redeemer. Now in verse 12, he says, therefore, therefore is a summarizing word. He's going to summarize what he's been talking about since verse 1 of Romans 5. Therefore, just as through one man, singular, sin, the word sin here is being spoken of as a condition, not a verb, a condition, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all, plural, men, plural, because all sin. Unless we understand what we've just got through reading in Romans 5, 12, it's impossible to understand 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. What the Apostle Paul is saying is that God created the human race through one man. In Genesis 2, 7 it says, And God breathed into Adam the breath of your translation. I don't care which one it is. It's L-I-F-E. That's singular. But if you look it up in your concordance, you'll see that the word is chai, C-H-A-Y, and it's speaking of plural. And it's not only in the plural, but it's in the masculine plural. Does anyone have a problem accepting the Adam is master. <laughs> then he created Eve. How did he create Eve? He took a rib out of Adam, and did he breathe into that, breathe, into that rib the breath of life? No, no, no. no. Why? Because life already existed from having breathed into Adam the breath of life. In Acts 17, verse 26, God feels that this is so important that he inspires Luke to say that from one blood, singular, all the nations of the world have been created. So, what Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15, and in Romans 5, 12, is that God corporately created the human race by breathing into Adam the breath of lives. Now, we can go back to 2 Corinthians 5 and take a look at verse 14 and 12, 15 again, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us, drives us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. What does that mean? It means that Jesus corporately took the human race upon himself at the incarnation in order to ethically and legally save the human race. Paul says the same thing in Galatians 4, 4 and 5. And when the fullness of the time had come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He could redeem those that were under the condemnation of the law. Verse 15 again of 2 Corinthians. And He died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. D. 
did Jesus make a clear distinction between objective faith and subjective faith when he spoke? Possibly one of the most recognized scriptures in the Bible is John 3.16. I know people that don't really believe in God, but they can rattle off John 3.16. Let's take a look at objective and subjective faith in John 3.16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Is that a fact? Yes. Yes. That is an objective fact or objective faith. Now what does Jesus say in the second half of John 3.16? And whosoever believeth in Him might or shall not shall not perish but have what? Everlasting life. That is the clearest distinction between objective faith and subjective faith in the scripture. And it comes from Jesus himself. Did God inspire the writers of the New Testament to make a distinction between objective faith and subjective faith? Again, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And you're going to see the strongest evidence of this distinction between objective and subjective. And the significance of it is how you and I, on which side do you and I choose to line up? Objective faith or subjective faith? 1 Timothy 4 verse 10. When you're there, say ready and I'll read 1 Timothy 4 verse 10, For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all, plural, men, plural, especially of believers. There it is. Did Jesus die for the whole human race? Yes. Was the whole human race atoned for at the cross? Yes. Yes. Does that mean that everyone is going to be in heaven? No. Does that mean that everyone that goes to church is going to be in heaven on Saturday? No. What makes the difference? Subjective faith. Especially who? The believers. And that's our topic this morning. The faith of Jesus. Because the word belief and faith are the same word in the original language. Another passage that is very important, and whenever you discuss the scripture with someone, and someone asks you, why are you a Christian? You can say, because I've decided to experience subjective faith instead of objective faith. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, let's take a look at 1 John 2.2. 2. 1 John 2.2. 2. When you're ready, when you're there, say ready. First John chapter 2, verse 2. And he, uppercase H, speaking of Jesus, himself is the sacrifice. Your Bible may say propitiation. That's a sacrifice. Or the mercy seat. For he himself is the mercy seat, the sacrifice for our sins. That's speaking of the condition of sin, not verb. It's speaking of the condition that he came to what? Conquer. Amen. I'm not going to digress here too much, but there's two ways of using the word sin in the Bible. One is speaking of my condition, and the other one is speaking of what the condition produces, which is what? Verbs. Sinful activity. And he himself is a sacrifice for our sins. Who is he speaking of there? The world or the believers? The believers, yes. Those that accept Jesus through subjective faith. But he doesn't stop there. He's saying it in reverse order as Paul did in 1 Timothy 4.10. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. There you have it. God inspired the Bible writers to make a clear distinction 
between objective faith and subjective faith. What is the significance of understanding the difference between objective faith and subjective faith from God's point of view? In the Old Testament, there's a very, very unusual event that is recorded in Genesis, the first book in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, God asks a 75-year-old man married to a 65-year-old woman to become gypsies the rest of their lives and leave their families, their relatives, very nice living. He says, I want to take you to a land that you've never seen. But in order to do so, you have to leave all of your family. Take your possessions, yes. But go. In Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3, he gives this 75-year-old man seven promises. Seven promises. And the reason that I wanted to read from the scripture, Romans 4, especially verse 24, is because these promises are for whom also? For us. Why is that important? Because God would like to bring an end to activities on planet Earth as soon as possible. But He needs to find a generation of people, not individuals here and there. God has always had individuals here and there that understood the purpose of life. But now He's looking for a generation of people that will focus and identify on what all of heaven is focused on. Which is to bring an end to life as we know it on planet earth today. Is that important? Amen. If you receive, and pick your favorite president. If you receive an invitation from the president of the United States to come and participate in some decision making situation and you have been singled out as someone whose contribution the president is looking forward to listening to, would you be impressed? Would every member of your family find out that you got this invitation? The creator of the universe is making an appeal to you this morning to identify with the ultimate purpose that heaven is focused on. And that is to prepare people to identify with what heaven is focused on so that Jesus can return. And that cannot happen until God has a generation of people that understand the difference between objective faith and subjective faith. So this 75-year-old man and his 65-year-old wife and all of their possessions go and become <laughs> By the time that the man is 83 years old and his wife is 73 years old, something continues to happen in their life. And what continues to happen in their life is that this woman is not able to bear this old man a child. So the woman decides that she has waited long enough. Maybe she's been to the gynecologist. Maybe. I'm not speculating here. But she is convinced that she cannot bear her husband a child because she's too old. And so she says to her husband, I want for you to take my slave girl and the two of you produce a baby. Sure enough. They followed her instructions. And they produced a baby. That horrendous event created an incredible human tragedy that we're still seeing today where cousins are killing each other in the Middle East. 
Israelis killing Arabs. Former President of the United States, Harry Truman, said, this has become the 100 year headache. These people killing each other. Had President Truman understood what you and I are studying this morning from Scripture, he would have called it the 4,000 year nightmare for God. In Genesis 17, 15 through 17, God speaks to this man now 99 years old. His wife is now what? If he is 99, what's she? 89. 89. And he says to this 99 year old man, in nine months your wife is going to bear you a baby. The reason that I cite this incident to you is because in verse 24 of Romans 4, our scripture reading this morning, it indicates that this event has a significant application to you and me today. So I invite you to turn to our scripture reading this morning, Romans chapter 4, and we're going to read a little bit. Romans chapter 4. When you're there, say ready. And we're going to start with verse 17 and then 18. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the sight of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. 18. In hope against hope, he believed in order that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Paul is quoting Genesis 15, 5 and 6. Where God says to Abram, I want for you in a dream, in a vision, at night. Abram is in his tent, and God says to him in his dream, I want for you to step out of your tent. And I want for you to look up in the sky and count the stars if you're able to. And the reason I'm asking you to do this, Abram, is because I want to visually demonstrate to you how large a family I'm going to bless you and your barren wife with. <coughs> Let's take a look at verses 19 to 22. And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, verse 20, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. 21, and being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Who made the promise? God. How long is it going to take us to believe that what God promises, He is able to perform? Because that's the reason we're still here. God has made a lot of promises in Scripture. But He cannot fulfill them unless I say, I believe you. In our study this morning, it's called subjective faith. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Why are you here today? I hope it's not because Saturday is the correct day to go to church. I was brought into the church and told, Hey, young man, Jesus is coming soon, and you need to be baptized and join the Seventh-day Adventist church or you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'm a candidate. <clears throat> The reason that you should be here this morning is because God's Word has creative power. Amen. Amen. The reason that God asked Adam and Eve <coughs> to, 
to rest the first 24 hours of their life was to celebrate a perfect and complete creation, a perfect in quantity creation. That's the purpose of Sabbath observance. To celebrate God's power to create. The incident that we're looking at in Genesis is to see how finally at the age of 100 almost, Abram decided, I'm going to believe God. And Sarah did too with a little resistance. Why? They had run out of all their options. They recognized that they were too old to physiologically bear a child. And when they reached that point, subjective faith, now what was God able to do? He produced a child. The child of what? Promise. Of promise. Because they were unable to produce anymore. It is crucial for us to understand and appreciate why Paul is recording this incident to prove to us that God, through two dead bodies, as far as the ability to produce a child, is able to create something from the dead. Amen. So, in activating through subjective faith, God was able to produce Isaac for that. Let's take a look at verses 23 through 25 now. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him. And here's it applies to us in verse 24. But for our sake only, also. That is the title of my remarks this morning. For our sake also. To whom it will be reckoned as those who believed in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. And finally, 25. He who was delivered up because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Amen. That last word I just read to you appears only two times in the New Testament. This in verse 25 of Romans 4 is the first time. The second time is in Romans 5, 18. And what it means in the Greek language is, I'm a business person, okay, so I'm going to give you a definition of a business person, not a pastor. But I became a very curious student of the Bible because I recognized that the Bible is inspired. And God is trying to find a people, a generation, that will identify with what all of heaven is focused on. And that means sometimes we have to look up some words in our Bible dictionary. Mm -hmm. And so I looked up this word, justification. First here in Romans 4.25, and then Romans 5.18. And it's dikaiosis, which is speaking of someone has paid a debt for someone else. It may be a mortgage in your house. You may be financing furniture. Someone has come along and written a check for that debt. So that debt has been acquitted. You no longer owe that debt. That is what Jesus did when he came to this earth. Praise Through his birth, life, death, and resurrection, Jesus has acquitted you of the debt of what? Sin. Does that mean that we're all going to be in heaven someday? No, that's not what the writer is talking about. The writing about. What he's saying is that what Adam and Eve did to you and me in the Garden of Eden, when they chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent, they brought upon us what? Condemnation. condemnation. Jesus has taken that condemnation away, acquitted us, according to Scripture. Amen. So it's impossible for you to be lost based on what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Does that mean that you still cannot be lost? You can still be lost. If you choose to just, what? Objective faith, or apply everything that you know from Scripture, and just let it stay at the level of objective faith rather than subject. And that is our study this morning. The point in all of this 
is that Abraham's faith in God's Word must become our faith so that the same object, the object of being, the creative power of God's Word in each one of us. 